Hi, welcome. I'm Kathleen Hudson and I am your guest host for the week while Eric is traveling. So today my guest is Poppy Balser, an artist from Canada, and she creates beautiful watercolors and oils too. Welcome, Poppy. We are Hi. actually changing the format just a little bit since Poppy and I will both be painting. Um, we're using the same reference image and I'll be painting an oil and Poppy will be using watercolor. So Poppy, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, well, um, you very kindly gave us gave me a selection of images to pick from, and one of one of the ones you showed me just had tremendous light on the water, and on the rocks, and the light bouncing around the scene was just I couldn't not paint it. So I'm <laughs> glad to have this opportunity. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Now for our art school live intro. It's art school live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. So as you all can tell, Eric is out of the office and traveling, um, but you can still keep up with his adventures on social media. So we have a little chronicle going called Where on Earth is Eric Rhodes? And he just sent us a clip from somewhere in Arkansas last night. Where am I? Well, I have no idea where I am, but I'm at a, a hotel somewhere along the freeway in Arkansas. That's what I can tell you because that's all I know. We've been driving for three days. I'm taking the dogs out for a little bit of a walk and uh, we are heading towards Austin, Texas. We're gonna be there late tomorrow night, hopefully. We might have to stay over one more night and then get an early start and get in the next morning. Not sure, but anyway, that's where I am and then turning right around and packing and heading to Europe. More on that later. He is a busy man. Um, but yes, so back to Poppy. So today's guest is Poppy Balser. She is a Canadian watercolor artist and she's been a regular feature at the Planner Convention and in Planner events throughout the US and Canada. She does beautiful oils as well. And when you saw her earlier, you might have noticed the painting behind her. That one won Best Water in the August Plein Air Salon. Um, we have a few prizes today for you all as well. So the prize, um, the prize today is Eric's marketing book. So to get a chance to win that, go ahead and put in the comments who you are and where you're watching from. I'm seeing people from all over already. We've got Another Canadian um, joining Poppy. We've got, that's Dale. Um, we've got some people from, oh, we've got several Canadians. Wonderful. Susan, hi there. And then Eddie watching from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of pe people chiming in. So go ahead and chime in and get a chance to win a book. Last show's winner is Jimmy Swift from Albuquerque, New Mexico. So you won a pair of value specs. Um, you can send an email to asl at streamlinepublishing.com to claim your prize. So we are giving you a free gift today, and that's an ebook. That's 10 Steps to Watercolor Mastery. And you can get that by going to watercolorlive.com slash 101 tips. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel Art School Live on YouTube, and you can see more of Poppy's work at poppybalser.com, and you can visit my website at kathleenbhudson.com. So now we'll get back to Poppy, who's changed the, the film around so that you can see her palette. Um, you, so you'll, you'll see today we're doing a demo on painting light on water in both watercolor and oil. Poppy can do both, and I also got my start painting in watercolor, so it will be really fun to talk through this and show you all a little bit about how we approach things. Um, so, Poppy, you can start us off. How are you? I, I see you got a drawing underneath. Um, do you do that in pencil? I do, yeah. I start with a pencil drawing. 
unless I'm specifically setting out to do a direct watercolor where I just leap in with paint. But typically I start with a pencil drawing so that I can establish my areas of light and dark. And that's, um, you know, sort of what drew me to this particular scene was the pattern of light against the, the, um, the dark of the landscape. My usual process is I do a drawing like this and then I paint it in black and white. I'm gonna take like a second to show you. This is a black and white study that I did. And with this one, um, what I what I did was I not only played with dark, darks and lights, but I played with cools and warms because that's part of what drew me to the scene. So I'll do my drawing, I'll paint it in like a, a black and white or, or temperature sketch like this to figure out if I like my picture and then I'll do it again and paint it in color. And that's what I'm gonna do now. So um, shall I just leap in? For it. Oh, I can't hear you, Kathleen. Oops, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so I'm ready to start painting. And uh, when I do start, I, I go pretty quick. So I'm gonna describe what I've got out here for colors, if that's okay. Um, what I've got is a blue, cobalt blue that I'm gonna use for the water. And I've got a neutral earth tone yellow that I'm gonna use for the warm areas. And I'm gonna do a quick, uh, wash over as much of the paper as I can to establish uh, the whitest areas by leaving them white and the cools and the warms in the scene as well. So the areas I'm going to leave white, I'll use this so you can see what I'm thinking about. I'm going to leave the water white, I'm going to leave some of the rocks white, and I'm going to try and paint through everything else. So I'm going to leap right in here. I've got a little bit of a blue that I've toned slightly with some uh, quinacridone rose and a little bit of the neutral yellow. And it's important to always test my color before I start to paint uh, for the background glitter. And it's hard for me to do, whoops, sorry, do a backwards stroke to get that broken watercolor line. So I'm, I actually rotated my paper there and that gives me some of the, some of that diffuse scattered light. And now I'm going to paint in the water as quickly as I can. I don't want to spend too long on this because the, the, more, the more I belabor it, the less fresh it will actually look. I don't want this to get dry. So I can't forget about that. Now, any of the rocks that I'm going to paint through and make darker or paint darker later, I can paint right through them right now with my blue. Oops, don't want that there. Kleenexes are great, or tissues, are a great uh, handy tool to have. It's basically like an eraser. They say you can't go back with watercolor, but if you're quick enough and you've got a tissue nearby, you can usually blot some out there whoops and I painted see I painted right through there and I didn't mean to I wanted to leave that because there's a little bit of surf there and I'm going to leave that for later now I want to suggest just a bit of the glow of the sun on the water so before I go any further I'm going to take some of my dilute mixture of uh, my neutral yellow. It's very dilute, so you can hardly see that. I don't know if you can see my test paper. You can. Yeah. Just put a little bit of a golden highlight on the water here and there. And I'm letting it run into the blue that I've already put down that's still wet. Doesn't matter if it runs a little bit. And that's just to suggest the, the shapes of the waves without, um, without again, getting too fiddly. So um, I talked about establishing a um, sense of cool and warm in the scene. This big rock in the middle, Kathleen, you probably know better than I, but I think this big rock is really big and it's quite a ways in the distance. Is that right? It is, it is. This is at Garapata State Park in California. So oh, cool. that is a large rock <laughs> that is yeah. offshore. Oh, really? It's not even connected to the shore? 
I don't believe so. You can kind of see right at the base how dark mm -hmm. it is. And it is, yeah. yeah, it's, um, so that's wet from mm -hmm. water coming up behind it. But oh, wow. this was a picture I took about five years ago. And so okay. it's, I, yeah, I actually don't remember exactly where it was. I was just mm -hmm. back there teaching a workshop last week, but okay. I, it's, uh, I, I didn't manage to recreate the exact same photograph. Well, you know, this looks like a place you'd have to do some hiking to get to, I thought. It looks uh, like it's at the top of a trail. But, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So what I did here was I painted through that rock with a cool tone because I want to push it backwards. I don't want it to be leaping out into the scene because I'm trying to create a sense of space as well. So... Having said that, though, I'm going to switch to a warmer shade and tr start to establish some of the warms in the scene, too. Let's see. So this big rock here is much closer to us than that rock back there. So I'm going to put a light wash of a warmer color over top of that, leaving some parts white. But I'd like to give it a sense of texture and the light hitting it right from the get-go. Let's see. This area here is in shadow, so it's going to be darker later. I can paint right through it. And this face here, I can just paint a golden color and add a little bit of pink to that. On the other hand though, this area here is in shadow. So I'm going to remind myself of that by putting a cooler light on it or a cooler t tone on it. And in here, this particular shadow has quite a bit of blue to it. So I'm putting some of that in now so I don't forget. And this is a little bit cooler because it's a, it's a cast shadow. And I could talk about that, but then I can't tell you what I'm doing. So. <laughs> I feel like reflected light is one of those things that once you learn to see it, you see it absolutely everywhere. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's part of what drew me to the scene was there was so much reflected light. I just, our rocks around here are predominantly a dull gray that gets black when it's wet. So it's so nice to have a scene where there's like white rocks with color reflecting in them so that's part of what drew me to this was just oh look at the colors in those rocks so i'm getting getting rolling on mine at the same time i always Great. start with the with the wash underneath and i like doing transparent underpainting and i think this probably dates back to when i started painting in watercolor and it, in oil, doing a transparent underpainting lets me go ahead and get the values mapped out on the canvas without mm -hmm. committing to, um, you know, to a lot of thick opaque paint. So it's very easy to go back in and change things. Yeah. I, when I start with an oil painting, I do something very similar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Funny that. Yeah. It's... It's interesting how that part of the process will, whoops, will translate so in, so nicely between the two mediums. It's just with watercolor, you can't go back over it later with something thick and, and uh, you know, change it. But that's that's okay. right. Yeah. So I'm trying to establish a sense of shadows here. Um, and Kathleen, if anytime you want to jump in and talk about what you're doing, please do, because I can't see what you're doing. <laughs> I'll have to watch the replay. Yeah, I'll keep describing what I'm doing too. Yeah, go for it. I do want to check out every so often. I, I'll check on the comments and see what people are saying from, um, you know, see if we have any specific questions. So, oh yes, what, which paper are you using? I'm using Arches Rough 140 pound paper, which is pretty much my go-to. I use that almost all the time. It's got a nice tooth, which lets me get broken brush marks like here and like here and here. 
that's harder to do on smooth paper. That makes total sense. I love Arches paper and I've used, I'm going to try to tilt this up a little bit. So, oh wait, never mind. We got the reference photo right up there in the top, um, the top right part of the screen so you all can follow along. Um, I, I bet the rough texture paper is going to be great for doing things like this shimmering light where the, the whole scene is backlit. Mm -hmm. So the sun is, is putting a lot of glare on that water. I'm sorry to interrupt. Poppy, would you be able to um, move your camera towards sure. your left a little bit? Um, this way? There you go. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. A little. Yeah. Please interrupt anytime you need to to make it work better. Maybe a little bit more because now that we're on a split screen. There, there you okay. go. Thank you. Thank Is you. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And so what I'm doing and starting off is I kind of tone the overall campus a mid-tone. Um, and then I drop in some of these shadow shapes just to indicate where shadows underneath rocks are. And I have some flexibility since I can go over all of this. But, and I don't have to be literal. That's another thing. We talked about this on Monday when we, um, when you all heard from Brian Sindler, who paints in acrylic. But you want to use photo reference as um, as an inspiration rather than as a literal guide. And that's something that Poppy is great at. You know, in watercolor especially, you, you want to embrace the fact that the medium is, is very spontaneous. And you can see that's something that Poppy is doing right now. You know, she's letting the watercolor flow. She's dropping in some different colors to wet passages and it creates interest. I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doesn't pay to be too, at least with the way I handle watercolor, it does not pay to be too married to your reference because it's going to, what it, you know, whatever the best laid plans are, it's probably going to change as soon as the water hits the paper. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And what paints do you like to use? Well, I'm today I'm using Michael Harding's new watercolor line. Ooh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I so haven't that's actually a lot of tested fun. them yet. Ah, yeah. They are really vibrant. I, I like them a lot. So um, that's what I'm using today. Uh, and uh, there we go. And this color that I'm using right now, I think I don't, I haven't seen anybody else making this particular shade. It's called Ochre Ickles Lemon. And uh, I like it as an earth tone. It creates an, it, it would do the same thing as like a raw sienna would, but it's more, tr slightly more transparent. So I like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what else is on your palette that you tend to? Sure. Yep. So that's the Ochre Ickles Lemon. That's Hansa Yellow Medium, which is usually my go-to yellow once I'm doing anything other than just creating a sense of golden glow. Um, because this, I find this one doesn't mix up any strong greens, but this makes beautiful greens, beautiful oranges. This is, there's some burnt sienna here. I used that for the value sketch. This is quinacridone um, rose, which is my go-to red. Uh, there's a little bit of a transparent oxide red here, but it, yeah it's almost too strong for what I'm trying to do. I may drop it into some of these shadow areas later. We'll see. This is a different yellow that I haven't used much of, and it sounds like a medication. It's benzimidazolone yellow, and it worked great in the water to just give it a hint of green. I've got um, cobalt, or no, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, and cerulean blue, and uh, cobalt teal here. So, um, those are the ones that I'm going to use today. And uh, yeah, I got I I um, was lucky enough to meet Michael at a plein air event in Bermuda years ago, and so and started using his oils. So when he came out with watercolors, I was very excited to give him a try. And uh, yeah, so now I'm lucky enough to paint for them, paint with them. It's great. 
they spent a long time developing those. I remember they mm -hmm. initially began um, developing them years and years ago. And then, you know, Michael is such a scientist when it comes to finding the right pigment <laughs> for the, the job that yes. it, it ended up taking much longer to debut the watercolors than they anticipated. But you know, that's, it, it's nice to work with somebody who's a perfectionist when it comes yes. to stuff like that. And good things I, are worth waiting for. Oh, totally. Yeah. So I am lifting out some highlights. Um, I've got that mid-tone laid down there and it's, it's already dry enough. See, it doesn't pick up. I can wipe it with the finger and it doesn't do much. And that's, that's what you want in oil. You know, one challenge with oil paint is that if you do this sort of transparent um, underlayer, then if you try to go right in and it's all really wet and, and sliding around, then your paint application is going to get really muddy. Um, and that's not an issue that Poppy is going to have here with watercolor. But well, yeah, you, make mud? <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely end up with an oversaturated piece of paper, especially painting plein air. I'm sure you've had that experience where things just won't dry for you. <laughs> it, yes especially, you know, at the seaside, um, where, you know, if it's foggy or if it's a wet day, it's a good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it just won't dry. Yeah. And doing a nocturne by the water is the worst because it just, oh, I bet. it doesn't dry at night. A lot of people come out to where I live in Colorado and have the opposite experience where things dry so fast that you can't even really lay in a wash. Yeah. I painted in Arizona and New Mexico a couple of times. And yeah, it's just, you're right. It's so fast to dry. It, it creates its own set of challenges. That's for sure. I find myself changing this rock shape a little bit because it's right in the center of the canvas. And I initially painted it as it, as it looks in the photograph, but I'm going to have to drop it down a little bit. I can see you did something kind of similar where you left it a little bit more. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, you, you, I guess are implying that some glare is coming around behind it instead of making it as dramatic and dark a shape as it appears. And I shifted the picture just a bit. Um, I, I left off probably, I don't know, depends on it. I left off one peak on the left hand side of the reference there, that, that one slope leading in. Mm hmm. I left that out because when I was working on my value study and then I did another color study too, because, you know, I wanted to be prepared. Um, <laughs> I felt like I was, my eye kept sliding off just the way I painted it, not so much the picture, but my eye kept sliding off and out the picture. And I thought, well, I don't want that. So I could, I'll just cut that bit off a bit and it helps move the rock too. That's right. Yeah. So again, another great example of using your reference, as an inspiration and not, mm -hmm. not a total map to go by. Yeah. All right. Um, I am also leaving out the little white rock in the absolute lower right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I left that out because I found it distracting in my value study. So. Yes, I'm, I had done that too. I hadn't actually mentioned it, but yes, if you sometimes see elements that have a strong either a really strong color or a strong contrast mm -hmm. light or dark um mm -hmm. near the edge of your reference image it's best to tone those down because you'll end up with some regrets if you if you have something with a dramatic high contrast right at the edge of your canvas yeah yeah you don't want to confuse people into thinking that right here is the most important part of the picture that's right because usually it isn't. Yep, save those contrasts for the focal area. That's right. Yeah. So the lightest light in my painting is definitely going to be the sunlight on the water. I assume it's probably similar for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and drop in that highlight. And I'm actually, in, in oil, I'm just going to use pure titanium white. Um, mm -hmm. And just kind of drag it across the top and then I'll go over it. I, there's a way of creating a little bit of the, the transparent glow that you can get in watercolor or in oil mm -hmm. glazes. If you take a transparent color over an existing opaque, and that's something I do quite a bit 
you know, where I'm, I'm actually drawing on my watercolor background um, to, to paint in oil because you, you can get some of those effects in oil. It's just a little bit more challenging. You know, the, what makes watercolors like poppies so luminous is that you're seeing light go through the pigment and bounce off the opaque white of the paper underneath. And so that's why watercolors glow. Um, you can see a little bit of that luminosity in Hudson River School paintings where artists would do a, an opaque uh, painting underneath, in, oftentimes in, you know, in more of a, a grayscale or monochrome, and then use color glazes over top to add color. And those transparent glazes left, you know, have this luminous effect because it's it's a way of treating oil paint almost like you would, you know, use a, a watercolor. But I'll just take some Indian yellow, which is my one of my favorite pigments. This is the Michael Harding one. And you can drag it right over the opaque white and just, you know, in a couple places, create a little bit of a, a tone to it. I want to actually push this a little bit towards red in places. And this is where I'm deviating from the, I, I am gonna deviate a little bit from the reference image, which has this as just pure white. You'll notice that frequently, like your photos will end up making highlights pure white, even if there was a little bit of an, a color tone to it in person. And so it's a, it can be a challenge to get that, that color back. <laughs> it's yeah, relying on the absolute reproduction of a photo is, is usually not necessarily the route for a satisfactory painting because the camera can't capture sort of what we're seeing in all, all its different variety. You know, it, it'll either be too bright or too dark or there's always something in the camera's take of the scene that doesn't quite match up with what we see. So, yeah, playing with the light and the dark, absolutely is kosher or, you know, a, a appropriate. I'm leaving the, the water white just because for the time being, just because I want to suggest that glaring light. And, and if I make it too dark too soon, I can't go back. So, <laughs> so that's, that's why I'm leaving right. it the way it is. I can always add color later. I can't take it out. So I've learned over a long time to be patient when it comes to figuring out what to do with the white highlights. I, they're not a problem I have to res resolve at the beginning. I can see you're establishing some of those darks as well, creating the mm -hmm. grasses. Yeah, and I've simplified that shape a little bit. I'm trying to suggest that there's a path coming down and going around here. I may have lost a little bit of it actually. So I'm gonna be a bit more selective in my blotting just there. We'll see if that helps, but I'm not, I'd love to paint the roots of that ice plant that's there, but that can't happen in an hour, <laughs> painting, <laughs> an hour painting demonstration. That's right. I'll get the greens in though. And then I have to drop some of the red of the leaves in, but I'm not gonna paint every single little leaf. That's the nice thing about the length of the Art School Live demos is that what you're painting is basically what you would be able to do with a small plein air study before the light changes dramatically. So yeah. it's sort of, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit like being out on location anyway, just having that time limitation. Yeah, it's kind, it's sort of a, yeah, whoops. You have to focus on the essentials. Gonna... Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a bit more authentic of an experience. <laughs> to... <laughs> For all that we're indoors and on camera. That's true. Yeah. That's an exercise that I sometimes have students do in workshops where we mm -hmm. do timed work or, you know, they have 40 brush strokes to complete a painting or something. You know, there are so many ways that you can learn at home. Um, and and be able to practice things like more fluid brushwork or, um, you know, more, more expressive painting and just, you know, set yourself up to, yeah. to learn more by giving yourself some limitations from the get-go. Yeah. Did you mention well, painting with a larger brush? Oh, that's, those oh, exercises? that's a good plan. 
<laughs> That's yeah. a great one. Yeah. I spent a month doing, was it a month? Two months doing little five by seven studies with a one inch brush. Wow. You can't do too much in a five by seven with a one inch brush. That's right. Yeah. So, no yeah. overworking there. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You're self-taught, <laughs> right? Overworking. What's that? <laughs> it's always possible. <laughs> yeah. So are you, are you mostly self-taught? I know that you've done well, some, some workshops here and there, but you, um, most of your learning was, was kind of self-directed. It, it really was. Um, I took up watercolor painting right after, right before, I guess, about three months before my oldest child was born. I switched from watercolors to or from acrylics to watercolors um kind of inadvertently um but i did and um, I, I didn't look back because the thing with you know with acrylics is they dry so fast yes. and you can't do that with a small child in the house because you just get a color mix and then you're interrupted and when you get even if it's a minor interruption you get back and the, the paint's dry so I was quite happy to uh, switch to watercolors and that was 20 years ago and I haven't, haven't looked back. So yeah. Anyways, the way I learned was books from the library. Hmm? Oh, I said, that's Sorry? amazing. I didn't know you'd actually started in acrylic. That's cool. Well, yeah. See, my dad painted in oils and my grandfather painted in oils, but I thought they were hard. So I thought I'd try acrylics and yeah, discovered that they were also hard. <laughs> So, Every medium has a challenge, doesn't it? That's right. It's all yeah. built on. Yeah. They each have their own challenge. And nobody told me watercolors were hard until I had already put enough time in that I didn't want to change. <laughs> so now um, I'm just going to uh, interrupt with a t technical bit of nattering away uh, because I'm starting to put a dark in here and I, I want to stop doing that because that's getting ahead of myself. I've kind of established a value pattern across the whole thing and a bit of a temperature pattern against the whole thing. You'll notice I haven't painted the sky yet and that was on purpose because if I put in the sky, then I would have had to wait for it to either dry or it would have been more complicated to put the water in. So now I'll put the sky in and then I will work on developing more of these shapes here. Okay, that's it <laughs> for the interruption. Sorry, Kathleen. Oh, don't apologize. <laughs> have you tried gouache? I have. I took a five week online gouache course with Uma Kelker. Um, last was it was March, I think, or May this year. And oh, cool. uh, I really enjoyed it. She was she was one of the um, plain air convention faculty last year. Um, and uh, she's very, you know, she's a watercolor and gouache painter. And uh, so I took her course and I learned a lot about just how to handle the medium. Um, as far as, you know, color and so on is, is not so much the issue, but it's just learning how to make that paint behave because it's, it's an opaque watercolor and I'm not used to opacity in the watercolor at all. So mm -hmm. it was really cool to learn from her sort of just put me through the steps of how to make the paint do what I want it to do. Yeah, I've tried it a bit here and there. I figured with your background in both acrylic and watercolor, it would be a pretty interesting thing to attempt. Um, yeah. And I've liked that it, you know, what I found is when I, try some gouache painting. I haven't done much, but mm -hmm. I've done enough to know that it's, it is kind of fun. I, I find that I'm, I feel a little less, uh, less tight than I do if I'm painting in, in watercolor. Um, just because I don't have to plan out everything perfectly. You like, you can yes. use a little bit of the, the opacity of the gouache to come back in and adjust things mm -hmm. where you want to. Yeah. And that's, that's, a really nice feature with that you can you can start with a fairly transparent wash or at least a really watery wash and then fix it or change it however you want by going on mm -hmm. top all right i am fiddling with the sky too much so i'm going to stop there but um 
well, I said I'm going to stop, but I'm not yet. <laughs> so everybody pay attention to Poppy because she is, she's doing something really valuable. That is, she is continually assessing her choices as she's in the process of painting. You know, so being a good self-critic is hugely important to your growth as an artist. And so having having that internal conversation with yourself about, you know, each brushstroke, why am I painting this? What am I doing in this stage? You know, you want to have a reason for everything you do. Um, so you're not just going through the motions. And so be like Poppy and go ahead and evaluate, you know, like wh what what you're painting and why. Um, and that self-reflection will pay off. You know, it takes a little time to stop and <laughs> take a little pause and ask yourself what you need to paint next and what you should focus on, but it is always worth it. Kathleen, I'm sure you do this too, but when you're outside painting, I bet you wear a track back from your easel at when you step back to see what you're doing. Oh, yes. Much earlier in the process than people might anticipate, right? Oh, totally. It's not the well, final it's most strokes. important. Hmm? Sorry. Oh, I, I, oh, I said, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's most important to do that at the very beginning. So I, you know, where you're really mapping out the values on the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, I, I do a lot of stepping back. I even bring a mirror on location and I'll look in this little pocket mirror and, and see what the painting looks like because it gives me a le level of critical removal from the work. So I'm not, not just adjusted to what's on the canvas. Yeah, it's the mirror is a really good trick, and I should do more of that. I have it's it's especially handy when you can't step back. And I saw you do a trick once where you used the black of your phone screen. Did I hope I'm not giving away your secrets? But I think you shared this on <laughs> stage <free. laughs> somewhere. You use the black of your phone screen instead of a mirror when you don't have a mirror with you. Yes, that's an option. That's something I, I learned from Olena Babek. I have had a couple of occasions where I've traveled to a plein air event and, mm -hmm. you know, the TSA doesn't exactly treat treat our luggage with the utmost respect. <laughs> I get it. They've got a lot on their hands. <laughs> but, um, but I've had a couple mirrors broken in my painting kit. And so what what I do in that case is just, you know, you can use the dark of your phone screen and you can see values in that. Um, you know, or any other reflective surface like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to kind of check things out because it looks totally different when you, just like when you come back in the studio or look back at a plein air study you've done a few days later and you start noticing things that you would have done differently. Um, so to be able to have that kind of critical removal during the process of painting is, is a big, big help. Yeah, that's actually, well, you can't see in my studio now, but there's a mirror behind where I'm standing right now. Um, so that if I step to the side and I've got my painting, right now I'm painting flat, um, but in the later stages, usually if I don't have a bunch of, you know, people watching what I'm doing on a preset camera, I would put it up on the easel in front of me and then I could step aside and look at it in the mirror and see what I need to change. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Secondhand shop. Don't. I've had people come up from. to me when I'm painting outside and say, "Oh, are, are you trying to see if you have paint on your face? You're okay." And I'm like, no, <laughs> oh, I love "Not it. what this is for." <laughs> <laughs> so one thing watercolors don't have to worry about quite so much. I'll come home from an oil painting session and have paint all over me. It migrates. It really does. Yeah. 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 It is a much messier medium in general. Yeah. So. Uh, easier to stay clean in the field with watercolor. <laughs> it is. Yeah. All right. I was getting fiddly with a little brush, so I put it, I'm going to put it out of reach for the time being. Trying to create some of these highlights on the rock. I need to tone down the value a little bit because, you know, it looks really bright to me when I'm just looking at the reference photo and looking at the rocks, but when I compare it to that highlight of the sun hitting the water, it is not, not nearly that light. So I need, it needs to be a step down. It's good to keep reassessing and thinking, okay, what's my lightest light and making sure that the other, you know, the kind of the secondary highlights in your painting aren't competing with it. 
Good advice. I feel like I should do that now. So I've got two brushes on the go, one with a purpley mixture and one with a warmer mixture. I need some fresh paper there. Uh, there, that's the warmer mixture. And so I'm using them alternating back and forth to hint at the forms and textures of the rock without painting every little detail. And I feel like this piece of rock that I'm painting right now is another one that's quite far away, connected maybe or leading out towards that big headland or that big rock that has the water on it. Okay. Oh, all right. June Finnegan comments that she is taking your in-person workshop in uh, March next spring. Oh, awesome. Hi, June. See you there. <laughs> is that in Nova Scotia? No, that's actually at the Forgotten Coast. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, that will be, that'll be a treat. I won't have to wear a down coat. Well, hopefully, <laughs> it was kind of cold there last year, but I won't have to wear a down coat and snow boots to, uh, to be outside, hopefully, there. March is a great time to be in Florida. Yeah, yeah. And you have some online workshops as well, right? That's right. I have, well, it's not a workshop. It's, I have a series of videos on how to paint the ocean in watercolor. Oh, cool. Yeah. They're on my website. And uh, yeah, I, I tried to, well, actually before I recorded it, I asked my email list, um, you know, what do you want to know about painting the ocean in watercolor? So I spent a couple of weeks collecting people's questions so that I could, you know, hopefully answer as many of them as I could. And I got a lot of really good questions. So that was really helpful. And uh, the video series is the result. Nice. So I think I lighten those foreground rocks too much. There's those rocks in the foreground, they are pretty bright. Yeah. Um, and they look really bright next to some of the shadows behind them. But I I don't want to push it too much because again, I want to reserve that highlight for the, the light on the water. That's telling yeah. the main story here. Yeah. And that's good advice. I'm going to have to put a very light wash on mine afterwards to tone them down a bit. So the water looks lighter, but I don't want to do that until I get uh, more of a feel for how the picture is developing. So I decide what exactly and how to uh, basically scumble some very dilute paint over that. creating some of these some of these highlights on these rocks I'm gonna keep it pretty toned down I can always push the, the highlights a little bit more later if I want to I don't have to nail the exact value that I want but again I'm trying to trying to keep values in a similar family over here and over here because those are both towards the outside of the canvas I want the viewers eye to stay in here so that needs to be where most of the contrast is These little pathways through the grass are interesting. Yeah, I, the first time I drew them, they did not look real. <laughs> it, do, it can look a little funky and that's something to bear in mind too. So, you know, Pop, Poppy brings up something good and that is if, if something looks a little goofy in a photo, it's really gonna look goofy in your painting. And so it's good to be reflective about it. You know, even if you like that detail, Maybe it's not something to include in the painting, uh, but just, you know, just bear it in mind as you're working and be totally flexible about maybe taking out a detail or two here or there so that the overall effect of your painting is stronger. I'll jump back over here and see if there are any, any further questions people have.
Wow, no technical questions. Look at that. <laughs> um, if you're if you are wondering about what what my surfaces are or my brushes, um, I'm mostly using the rosemary um, ivory. This is the one right here is actually a silver brush Bristlon flat. And that's about as similar as I can find to the rosemary ivory ones. Um, it's a synthetic brush. And for a small painting like this, I'm working on a six by eight oil primed centurion linen um, canvas panel. And that one is, it, it, it's pretty small. So I don't necessarily need to break out the huge brushes. Um, I did start off with a wash using a Rosemary Mundy mop. So let's see, I don't know if it'll focus on it, but yeah, this is the three quarter inch Mundy mop. And that's, it's a good way of getting some of that wash on the canvas. What brushes are you using Poppy? I'm you also anything using, up? yeah, I'm using Rosemary brushes. Uh, these are the series uh, 72. 320 uh, one stroke sable brushes that I just adore. They, and they're flat brushes. A lot of watercolor painters use round brushes, uh, uh, but these are all flats. And the reason why is I can make a lovely fine mark with uh, the corner of this if I want to. There, tiny little mark, great big brush. It's like a round brush in that respect if it has you know round brushes with good points. But this lets me fill a large area really quickly when I need to. So that's what I like about these brushes. They are, I really like them. I don't know if you can get them in the States though. I'm sorry, folks, because you, yeah. I think there's a rule now about importing sable. Oh, really? Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. I assumed. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think wild. that's the problem. I can follow up with uh, with Simi and find out for sure. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. that was funny. They, yeah. I remember there was a lot of uh, a lot of sadness in the art community when they had to stop using the real mongoose. But they managed to create a great um, a great replacement for it. Their synthetic mongoose is wonderful for their master's choice flats that they have. Yeah, and there yeah. are some really good synthetic watercolor br bristles now. Um, if I had to change, I could, but I really like these brushes. So. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as I can get them, I'll use them. I'm creating some of these rock shadows. There's going to be some blue light, even in some of these shadow areas. So the cast shadows are picking up light from the sky overhead. And that is, you know, clearly on a day like this, where the sun is, it's full sun on everything, um, the sky is going to be blue. And so that's why you're going to see a very cool cast shadow. The sunlight is very, very warm by contrast. It also means it'll create a distinction between the reflected light on the rocks. You can see on the undersides of some of these rocks, like right here, in, in my painting, there's light bouncing up from where the sunlight is hitting the ground plane and it's reflecting up onto the undersides of some of these rocks. And that is, that is called reflected light. If you look at Soroya's work, it's all over the place in his paintings. Um, once you see it, you'll, you'll start seeing it everywhere in the landscape. Um, but it's, you know, especially on a, on a subject like this where you're painting rock forms in full sun, you're going to see a lot of reflected light at play. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I, I can't see your part of your painting right at the minute where I'll see it in the replay. But this area right here where I just painted, that's quite orange. If you look, yes. you know, that's quite orange because the light's hitting from here up in there, whereas up here, the shadow is noticeably less orange because I'm assuming the shelf of rock that's coming out this way is preventing this light from bumping up into that space. So this will appear bluer here as compared to that orange there. That's right. But Kathleen explained it very much better than me. Oh, well, no. <laughs> explained it very well. Thank you. You saved me <laughs> struggling with it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, if you can teach yourself to see it, out in the landscape, then um, it, it is really fun to paint. 
because all of a sudden your paintings will start looking, you know, multi-dimensional, and that's that's always a good thing. Here's that, here's that second layer of rock that Poppy was talking about. I'm painting that, that kind of lighter color. I want to be careful and not repeat shapes. I'm noticing that, you know, sometimes in, even in nature, um, you'll see some shapes that look a little bit repetitive where there's an angle that's the same. And if you see it, don't, don't necessarily paint it that way because the more you can create variety, the more interesting your painting will be. So you can create variety even where you might see a slightly repetitive shape in nature. Another good example of when not to be married to your photo reference. Yeah, there were a couple of little shapes just in the foreground a couple of little rocks down here that are almost the exact same shape. And when I was drawing, I spent far longer than I should have, making sure that they, well, I don't know about what should have, but I spent a long time making sure they did not look the same. And I'll probably right. put a brush stroke on them and they'll look, come out look, <laughs> looking too similar, but that's, that I can fix. Now that I've identified the problem, it's easier to fix it. I can drop a couple of these greens in here quickly. I'm, um, so we'll, we'll take about, five more minutes and then we'll go into, oh, actually maybe, maybe only two, we're running a little <laughs> low on time, but we'll talk a little bit about realism live and, and show a video on that. And while we're doing that, Poppy can continue to work on her, her demonstration so that she can bring it as, as close to a finish as you'll see here. We can drop the finished image in comments later as well. So you can see it in the comments on YouTube and on social media. Absolutely. So I'll do some of this. We'll show. Was there anything else you wanted to share before we transition into Realism Live? Uh, I don't think I said thanks for inviting me on. <laughs> so I should say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a real treat to be here. And uh, I, you know, I'm grateful to everybody that tuned in from Canada. I heard there were a bunch at the beginning. Um, and I'll enjoy looking back and, and seeing who's here. So that's great. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll go ahead and fun. This is fun. So Realism Live is going to be a great opportunity. Don't pass it up. Um, you'll 
not only have the opportunity to learn from all of the folks that are referenced on screen here and in that video you just saw, but you will also have the chance to network with other artists. Um, so they'll have small breakout groups during Realism Live where you can talk with other artists who are um, on, the, on the journey just like you. Um, you can also visit realismlive.com and today you can use the discount code Hudson, H-U-D-S-O-N, and you can get 10% off your registration. So you can go to Realism Live and register for that so you don't miss it. Um, you can also register for a free roundtable that's hosted by Kelly Kane, who is the, um, she's the editor of Plan Air Magazine. And so she's talking about how to find your authentic voice and grow your art career. And she's talking with Cindy Barron, Wendy um, Caporale Green, Victoria Herrera, and Vicki Sullivan. And so that's going to be Thursday, October 19th at 4 p.m. Eastern. So you can register for that at realismtoday.com slash roundtable. Um, so we'll real quickly return to Poppy's painting and we'll I'll talk with her about how she's bringing it all together here. So you can see she's, she's coming in with some of these beautiful darker tones in the water. And what that's going to do is make the, the highlights on this water stick out. Um, so that's the story of this painting. And it is really glowing. That looks great, Poppy. Oh, phew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was, um, while off screen, I sort of took a step back and realized, oh, I really need to emphasize that light. So um, that's what I'm working on here. And I'm trying, you know, this is where one of these brushes is great because I can use the corner uh, and I'm making little marks, but then I can make them also quite a bit larger. I don't know if you can see here, but I can make a quite a large wave shape. So I'm, I'm trying to just suggest sort of the patterns on the water without getting too finickety, as I said earlier, and just little broken motes of light dancing on the water is what I'm aiming for here. Totally. To... It looks like a calligraphy almost that you're doing with, because of the square brush you chose to use. Yeah, well, painting waves, it re less really is more. So, you know, the more I can suggest with less brush strokes, the better. That's what it boils down to. So. That's awesome. And is there yeah. anything that you want to leave people with in terms of a takeaway today? Oh, boy. Um, remember to think ahead and identify the areas that are white that you're not going to paint through. You can always add to them later. Uh, you can't take necessarily take the paint out. So it's okay to leave a space blank while you decide what to do with it. For example, right here, I was thinking about putting some of this cobalt in to show that little bit of surf. Don't know if I'm going to do it because I kind of like how glowy that is at the moment. So I'll have to, you know, I don't mind that I left it white. If I painted through it, I might be less pleased. Gotcha. Well, yeah. it looks beautiful. You've done a wonderful oh, job. You. I can't wait to see yours. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Do you want to paint around yeah. your studio for a second for folks? Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Um, bear with me. For, here's my other, here's the other color study I did. Ooh, nice. preparation. So this is another completed version she's got. <laughs> yeah. I have to turn my camera around. Um, now you're going to get a close up of my face for a second, unless I dodge real quick. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, what can you see? Okay, so here's my studio, and uh, I'm going to take the take the camera off, so you can. Um, sorry. Wonderful. And there's yeah. that painting. So that there's the painting. The in the yes, thank salon. you. I'm so bad. You can tell I'm really bad at selfies. My I'm sure if my daughter saw this, she'd be like, "Oh, mom, mom, you're so bad." <laughs> So this is, I have a north facing window, which is wow. really handy for painting. Um, here's my setup. So I paint with my Mac, with the references that I work from on my Mac when I'm not outside. And I have a table. Is this the sort of thing you meant by a studio tour? Yes, totally. Yeah. So this is my work surface. I have, if you're interested in lighting, I have two lights set up and just a, you know, not fancy Amazon purchase for my camera mount. And uh, here's where the rest of the, you know, framing and packaging and all that stuff, business stuff happens. So, yeah. So that's, um, that's my studio. 
Well, thank you so much yeah. for joining us today, Poppy. This was this was absolutely great. It was a treat. It was a lot of fun. I'm I'm it was neat to hang out online, even though you know couldn't see it. It was neat to talk and absolutely. paint together. Yeah. I hope we get to do it soon again. Wonderful. Well, let's yeah. plan on it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And thank, thank all of you for joining us today. Um, don't forget to register for Realism Live and um, check out Poppy's website, follow her on Instagram and learn more about watercolor and oil since she does both beautifully. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you, everybody.